Good afternoon and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. My name is Sarah Bankson and I'm Associate Director of RTP here at the Federalist Society. Today, July 18th, 2023, we are pleased to host a discussion on Virginia's new approach to regulatory modernization. Please note that as always, all expressions of opinion on today's program are those of the speakers. After the discussion, our panel will take audience questions, so please submit those questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our moderator today is Anastasia Bowden, Director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. Before joining Cato, Anastasia was a civil rights attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation, where she led the organization's Equality and Opportunity Program. She also co-created the podcast, DIST, which tells the stories behind infamous Supreme Court dissents. In the interest of time, I'll stop there, but you can read the full and impressive bios for all of our speakers at regproject.org. Thank you all so much for joining, and now I will hand it over to you, Anastasia. Well, thanks, Sarah, and thanks for joining us, everyone. As uh, someone who spent 10 years representing entrepreneurs who hopes had been crushed by unnecessary and anti-competitive regulations, Virginia's project is very special to me. I know when you talk to these entrepreneurs, it's not always just one big policy that's holding them back. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's instead a thicket of overlapping and complex policies that makes their lives impossible. So I'm glad to see Virginia is trying to cut back that thicket. Today, I'm joined by three experts in the field who can talk about what Virginia is doing and how states can replicate that effort. And I'm hopeful that they will. First, we'll hear from Andrew Wheeler, who's the director of Virginia's Office of Regulatory Management. He's also the former administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Wheeler has dedicated his career to advancing sound environmental policies, beginning his career as a special assistant in the EPA's Pollution Prevention and Toxics Office, and later working as Majority Staff Director and Chief Counsel of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Next, we'll hear from Reeve Bull, who's the Deputy Director of Virginia's Office of Regulatory Management. Prior to this role, he was the research director of the Administrative Conference of the United States, where he worked on projects related to international regulatory cooperation, the use of science by administrative agencies, presidential review of agency rulemaking, and very appropriately for today's event, reg regulatory benefit cost analysis. Last, we'll hear from Caroline Sicko, an assistant professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, where she teaches administrative law, environmental law, and torts. In her research, she focuses on environmental and energy law and regulation, administrative law, and agency practice of cost-benefit analysis. For today's event, first, I will hand it to Director Wheeler and Reeve Bull, who will outline uh, Virginia's Office of Regulatory Management. We'll get some reactions from Professor Sicko, and then we'll get into questions and answers. So please feel free to use that question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen, and I'm sure our panelists would love uh, to, to hear what you have to ask. So with that, I'll hand it over to Director Wheeler. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh Appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you today um, with my deputy Reeve um, by my side. And um, what we're doing here in Virginia, I, I think is very unique. First of all, um, Virginia was at the forefront of regulatory transparency back in the late 90s under Governor um, George Allen when they created the website virginia.townhall.gov. Uh, Virginia um, where you can go and look at any of the regulations or guidance documents pending and you use that website to comment so the public can comment through that website. It was very innovative, but we didn't do a whole lot since then to increase innovation. When Governor Youngkin came in last year, he looked at this, the status of our regulations in particular, and he was concerned. Um, we have over 64, 65, depending on how you count them, agencies that have the ability to promulgate regulations. Of those agencies, um, 22 were exempt from having their regulations reviewed by the governor's office or by the secretaries. It could go straight from an agency to the registrar without any further um, review. He was concerned about that. And under Virginia law, every governor is supposed to issue a new executive order in the first six months of, of their tenure to lay out the regulatory process for what would guide their administration. 
And what Governor Youngkin did last year was um, in his executive order, Executive Order 19, create our office, the Office of Regulatory Management, ask us to review all regulations, whether the, the exempt agencies or non-exempt agencies. He wanted us to review all of them. He wanted us to take a look at the um, impact analysis, cost impact analysis for all regulations. And he also asked that the um, cost impact analysis apply to guidance documents, which I believe is a first. I'm not aware of any other states that require cost impact analysis for guidance documents. So when he set up our office, he was concerned about transparency and efficiency. The second aspect that he was concerned about is the length of time it took for regulation from start to finish. It took on average three to four years for regulation from start to finish. And part of that um, bottleneck of regulations, regulations were sitting in the governor's office on average 241 days. And this is a statistic, statistic that goes back over a decade. This was not, because this was in the first couple months of his administration, this was not during his administration, but on average it was taking regulations to be reviewed by the governor's office 241 days. So when creating this office, he said, I want transparency. I want the, the, all Virginians to know what the regulations are, what the guidance documents are, what the cost impact would be. And um, I, want it to, I want the process to move more efficiently. Um, since we were created, we started reviewing regulations last August on August 1st. And our average, um, since August 1st, we've reviewed um, over 200 new regulations, and our average is 11.9 days to review a regulation compared to the 241 days um, over the previous decade. On guidance documents, um, we've reviewed over 80 guidance documents since February 1st, and our average for guidance documents is 6.8 days. So we've transformed the process into be much more efficient and much more transparent in that all regulations are now reviewed and the cost impact analysis is, is available for the public. In addition, the governor also called for a 25% reduction in regulatory um, requirements. Not, not a reduction in regulations, um, in a hard number of regulations, but in, regu in regulatory requirements. Um, and simple aspect would be counting the number of shalls or must in a regulation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my deputy Reeve, who's gonna talk a little bit more about our cost impact analysis as well as our regulatory reduction requirements and how we're going about counting those. Brief. Wonderful, thanks Andrew. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for, for joining us today. So um, as, as Andrew mentioned, I'd like to cover two uh, things, the regulatory economic analysis and then the regulatory reduction before turning it back over to Andrew to discuss our permitting work uh, as well. Um, so with respect to those two components, the way that, that I like to think about it is a, a well-functioning regulatory system uh, needs to do two major things. One, it needs to review new regulations to make sure that they basically are as efficient as possible, that they do more good than harm. Uh, and then it also has to have a mechanism in place for reviewing existing regulations to determine if they still make sense, if they should remain on the books. Um, and I think that we in Virginia have actually been innovators um, in, in both of those spaces. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes to sort of describe the innovations that we've achieved on um, both of those areas, achieved and are continuing to achieve, because of course it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, so starting with, with the new regulations. So um, the key uh, when an agency is considering a new regulation is, is to make sure it does more good than harm the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, and in order to do that effectively, it requires economic analysis. Um, and this is something that actually um, the federal government has been doing for, for quite some time. Um, it goes back at, at least to the 1980s and, and really earlier than that, it actually goes back arguably to the Johnson administration. Um, but basically federal agencies for a lot of years have sort of developed a process for doing benefit cost analysis. Um, now we think uh, in recent years, in the recent administration, that you know they've taken a few steps backwards with respect to the revised circulatory form. But um, the overall process, generally, you know, is something that that's pretty widely accepted. What's interesting, though, and what we found out is though this is very well established at the federal level, 
uh, it was virtually non-existent at the state level. There are a handful of other states that do similar things. Rhode Island actually um, was one of the major states that we looked at um, in terms of when we were designing our process. Colorado and Washington have also done some work in this space. Um, but really it was pretty unique. Uh, there are very few states that have actually done um, you know, the sort of thing that, that we set out to do uh, when we stood up this office. Um, and in some sense, that was a challenge because, you know, since the federal government has such a well-developed uh, system for benefit cost analysis, you know, almost all of the agencies have economists on staff. Some agencies have very well-developed economic staffs. Uh, that's not the case at all in Virginia. There may be a handful of agencies that do have an economist or two, um, but it's relatively rare. Um, so uh, that was a challenge, but we also saw it as an opportunity. Um, and I can sort of explain how, um, partly because of that necessity, we think the approach we've adopted is, is really quite innovative, uh, is something that other states, I, I think, can and should adopt. And, and hopefully, eventually, it may be something influential for the federal government um, as well. Um, so uh, let me just sort of describe briefly how the system works. So first of all, as, as Andrew mentioned, um, we apply uh, regulatory economic analysis to all of the regulations, as well as guidance documents that Virginia agencies issue. Um, that's quite a bit different uh, than the federal government. The federal government, um, it's limited under Executive Order 12866 uh, to significant regulations, and then particularly economically significant regulations, which is sort of the small tranche that traditionally had more than $100 million in annual economic impact. It's now $200 million in annual economic impact. Traditionally, that was about 1% to 2% of the regulations. It's now presumably less or fewer because of the change. Um, so you're talking about a very, very small tranche you know, of regulations that get reviewed, whereas we review everything. It's across the board. Um, and uh, because of that, and because the agencies don't have economists on staff, we intentionally designed it in a way that we thought was much more streamlined. So if you look at what happens federally, you know, it's a relatively small percentage of regulations, but the regulatory impact analyses tend to be huge. You're talking about multiple hundreds of pages in most cases. Uh, whereas if you take a look on our town hall website, our uh, analyses are much, much shorter than that. It's probably around like eight to nine pages uh, on average, much, much shorter. Uh, and we intentionally designed the system in a way to promote that. So, you know, neither Andrew nor I is an economist. So um, as we were putting together the regulatory economic analysis manual that's up on our website, um, we intentionally designed it in a way that would resonate with non-economists. And, and in particular, we really placed the focus, and, and this is, I think, another difference vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, we really placed the focus on sort of the foundational question. So a regulatory economic analysis has four components, defining the problem, uh, looking at the alternatives, looking at the benefits and costs of the alternatives, and then looking at some targeted effects on, on families, small businesses, and local governments. Um, and as you might guess, at the federal level, the focus really tends to be heavily on the benefits and the cost, calculating the benefits and the cost. And that's a, an important component of what we do too. But we really tried to put the emphasis on those first two questions. Is there a problem? Uh, and if so, what are the alternatives? And we actually asked the agencies to look at at least three alternatives, uh, what they're actually proposing, doing nothing, just leaving the status quo intact, and then at least one other option. Um, and they are supposed to calculate out the benefits and cost of each of those and then explain why they chose the one that they did. Um, and we think that this is much simpler, um, much more straightforward for the Virginia agencies to do. Um, and I think another real benefit of it is that as a consequence of that, it's much more transparent. Um, you can log on to the town hall website, you can find all of these. And, you know, even if you're not an economist, um, you know, we're not economists and, and they're really pretty straightforward. You know, it's the sort of thing that, a small business or a general, you know, a member of the public could pick up and understand um, and hopefully could weigh in as well as part of the process. We think it makes it much easier to promote public participation, uh, which we think is, is critically important. 
Um, it's actually really important at the state level because you get fewer comments, but the comments tend to be taken very, very seriously by the agencies. They often change the regulation in response to the comments. So our hope is that this makes it a lot more open, a lot more transparent, a lot easier for members of the public to then weigh in and provide the sort of information that agencies will, will find useful. Um, so that's the process for the new regulations. Um, and take a look at our town hall website if you're interested. You know, it really sort of lays out the manual and then, you know, regulation by regulation, each of them has one of these forms. Uh, let me take a few minutes also to, um, to discuss the process for the existing regulations, the older regulations. Um, and here too, we think that what we're doing is, is really quite innovative. So to sort of take a step back, um, you know, so-called retrospective review, which is basically the process by which agencies look at the regulations they have on the books and decide if they still are needed, it goes back pretty far at the federal level. Um, we actually did a project at ACUS where I worked before on retrospective review, and we found that it goes back at least to the Carter administration. Um, but to be perfectly honest, it really didn't produce a whole lot then, and it really, you know, didn't produce a whole lot between him and the Obama administration, which was actually the most recent um, administration to put out a, an executive order on, on retrospective review. Um, and I think the problem was it's kind of an incentive issue. The agencies really don't have much of a reason to upset their own handiwork. Um, you know, they tend to sort of look at the regulations and say, okay, this looks fine, you know, we're, we're not going to change it. Incidentally, we had a similar process here in Virginia. Every four years, the agencies are required by statute to do so-called periodic review, where they review all of the regulations they have on the books. But if you take a look at the periodic reviews, traditionally, it's similar to what you saw at the federal level, where they say, OK, we looked at it. We still need this regulation. We're not going to change. Um, so in the last 10 years or so, there's been some innovation in the space. A lot of um, countries have adopted what's commonly called a regulatory budget. Uh, the Trump administration did this via executive order. They had an executive order 13771 um, that imposed a so-called two for one requirement for every uh, one new regulation. Agencies had to find two existing regulations to get rid of. A handful of other countries have done similar things, Canada, Australia, the UK, most recently the European Union uh, has done something like this. Um, so those are increasingly common at the national level. At the state level, um, what's much more common is actually a reduction target, um, where states will say, okay, we want to try to reduce the number of regulations by X percentage. Um, and ultimately, uh, Governor Yunkin and his executive order 19 did something somewhat similar to that. It is a, it is a target similar to the other states, a 25% reduction target. Um, but there are a handful of aspects of it that we think make it unique, different from what any other state or even any other country has done. Um, and we think actually works quite well. It's quite sophisticated in terms of their approach. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, one of the first distinctions is that unlike um, a lot of the national regulatory uh, reduction efforts, we don't focus on the number of regulations, we focus on the number of requirements in regulations, which we think is a much better metric. Um, because I mean, you can easily see how you might have, you know, one massive regulation and then two minuscule regulations, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to game that system. Uh, whereas focusing on the number of requirements um, is much more nuanced and it ensures that there's a, a genuine change in the overall regulatory burden. So that's the first innovation. The second innovation is that um, we realize that there are ways to streamline regulatory burdens without necessarily um, striking must and shalls. So an example we often give, and we can maybe get in more in the discussion to some other examples, but the one uh, Andrew and I often like to cite is, uh, our Board of Barbers and Cosmetology reduced their training hours um, for new cosmetologists from 1,500 hours to 1,000 hours. So if you look at that, they haven't gotten rid of a requirement. The requirement is still there, uh, but they have substantially reduced the burden of the requirement. It's now 33% less burdensome than it was um, because they substantially reduced the number of hours. Um, so we're giving agencies credit for that. Um, if they've 
reduce the burden without necessarily striking it, uh, we give them, give them credit for the cost savings. Um, and then one final thing we also do as part of that is, um, is we look at guidance documents as well. Um, hopefully guidance documents should not include requirements. Um, unfortunately they do in some cases and we're urging the agencies to move any requirements that they have out of guidance documents into regulations. Um, but another thing we're looking at is just the overall length of the guidance documents. Um, if you go on our website, you'll see a lot of agencies have a lot of guidance documents. A lot of them are very long um, and that can be difficult for um, especially businesses to, to, to navigate. Um, sometimes the guidance documents are even out of date or, or no longer applicable. Um, so we're urging the agencies to go and look at all of those and, and, and make sure that everything is up to date, that it's written in the most streamlined uh, way possible um, and that it's uh, you know, right-sized in terms of um, you know, the overall amount of guidance that agencies are issuing. Um, the final thing that I'll mention is we have a, a guide, a regulatory reduction guide that's up on our websites that sort of describes this overall process. And both the regulatory economic analysis manual and that guide um, we think are useful resources, especially for other states, uh, to take a look at. Um, you know, we've chatted with people in other states and, you know, there's been some interest. Uh, and we think that these are the sorts of resources that would need to be modified to some extent, but other states could probably pick this up and, and do something similar uh, to what we're doing. And I wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel because, you know, these resources are now in place. Um, so let me stop there and turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you, Reeve. Um, so I'm just going to briefly highlight what we're also doing on permitting reform and efficiency. So last year we started a pilot at our Department of Environmental Quality called the Permitting Enhancement and Evaluation Platform, or PEEP. And to think about this, think of a Gantt chart for each permit, and think about the tracking systems that are typically used by some of the, um, some of the mailing companies, FedEx, UPS, et cetera, where you can go online and track where your package is from where it was shipped, where it is in each of the steps until you finally receive it. We're doing that for permitting as well. So we create a Gantt chart for each permit type that has a, has a bar, um, it's, it's a bar graph that's available on the dashboard at DEQ right now for all of the water permits as of this past December. And they are currently putting all the, the, the rest of their permits on the system as, as we speak throughout this year. Um, our office is taking this pilot and expanding it to five other departments. We're expanding it to our Department of Conservation Resources, which handles a lot of, of the uh, resiliency and, and water issues, as well as our Marine Resources Department, our Department of Energy, our um, Department of Transportation, and our Department of Health. Um, altogether, we've identified uh, approximately, I believe, 300 permits across all of those uh, agencies, and we're working to build out the Gantt charts for each of those, and they'll be available to the public so that you can go online and you can see where the permit is in each stage. And this is, I believe, very unique as far as other states are concerned. Um, this has both a public function and, and, um, and a government function attached to it. The public function is the Gantt chart. You see um, it, it's supposed to be in the first agency for 30 days. The second agency takes it over for 40 days and it, it goes through each step of the process. And it has the, um, the, the date when the permit is expected to be um, decided the decision date. If a permit gets delayed, that decision date, which is, uh, which is um, shown by a red bar, that red bar stays in place, but the rest of the Gantt chart expands out and a new deadline bar appears. So you can tell that this permit is late and that a decision has not been made. So if you are the applicant, you can see where it is, including if it's been returned to you. Um, at this point, the only people that we found that are unhappy with this system are, um, the contractors that applicants hire, um, because sometimes the permits are returned back to the app to the contractor, and the contractor likes to blame the state or this or state agencies for holding up a permit when in fact it's sitting on their desk. We've had a few instances where a permittee has called um, the Department of Environmental Quality to ask where the permit is. The director has gone onto the dashboard and said, "Well, let me see where it is. Oh, it's with your agent, uh, and your agent hasn't responded to our questions." So this is an opportunity to provide more transparency. It's also an opportunity to provide more transparency to the public because you can search 
the database to see what permits are currently being reviewed in your um, in your area code, for example, not your area code, your zip code, for example. Um, and over the course of my career, I found that a lot of permits, a lot of projects that end up having a lot of opposition, um, it's partly because people don't realize about the project until very late in the process. So this alerts people as soon as the permit is filed to all the permits that are going on in their area of the state. The second aspect that I want to just mention briefly is on the management side for internal um, processing. And this will hopefully lead to long-term efficiencies in the process. The, um, the permit is assigned to a, uh, to a permit um, writer or analyst um, within each agency for each individual permit. That person gets an email one week generated by the system, one week before the permit deadline, saying you have one week to complete your review of this permit. They get another email the day before the deadline, saying you have one day left to review this permit before the deadline. The day of, they get another email. The day after, if they haven't completed their work on the permit, they get an email saying this permit is now one day late. After a week, the manager gets an email saying um, this permit is one week late. After two weeks, the manager's manager gets an email. And after three weeks, in the case of DEQ, the director of DEQ gets an, an, automatic, an automated generated email saying the following permits are now three weeks late. So this will hopefully um, turn into more efficiencies long term. And it fulfills Governor Yunkin's goal of more transparency and more efficiency in all of our state actions that we do on behalf of, of the citizens of the Commonwealth. And with that, I'll turn it back to Anastasia. Well, thanks to you both. You know, I was listening with interest to, to some of the other states that you've looked at, and I was just shocked, shocked to hear that you hadn't looked at my home state of California for ideas about regulatory reform, because uh, we all know well, it's we a paradox. We have, as a bad history. example. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Professor Sika, you've obviously done a lot of thinking about regulatory reform and cost-benefit analysis, and we'd love to hear any reactions you have to Virginia's program. Sure. Uh, th thank you, Anastasia, for the introduction, and I'm really happy to be here uh, to talk about Virginia's regulatory reforms. Uh, so, um, as you heard, much of my research focuses on the practice and the judicial review of cost-benefit analysis, albeit usually on the federal level. So the federal government has had um, a requirement for agencies to do cost-benefit analysis for significant regulations since President Reagan's executive order in 1981. And while the analysis at times still leaves much to be desired, you see the work of uh, my frequent co-author Robert Hahn and others, um, I am ultimately a big supporter in the role that cost-benefit analysis plays in regulatory policy. I think the process of thoughtfully, comprehensively, and systematically considering both the costs and the benefits improves regulations and makes society better off. It's difficult to prove this though to, skept to those who are skeptical of its role because it's difficult to show what would happen in a world without the cost benefit analysis for any given regulatory context. But there are anecdotes that suggest that the analysis makes a big difference. Christopher Demute, reflecting on his time as administrator of OIRA uh, during the Reagan administration, described how the administration imposed a stricter standard for phasing out lead and gasoline, um, stricter than the one they had uh, inherited and thought they would uh, get rid of, and it was based on the results of a cost-benefit analysis. Oftentimes, market-based approaches uh, have come under serious consideration because of expected cost savings that are revealed in a cost-benefit analysis. Um, we've already mentioned uh, one example, one antidote uh, regarding the regulatory requirement uh, reduction aspect of the initiatives in Virginia, the training hours for cosmetologists, and I hope we'll get more antidotes, especially for the cost benefit uh, requirements, because I think these are powerful concrete examples of what regulatory reforms like this can do and why they're important. Um, but putting aside antidotes, Virginia in my mind, has already made some significant advances in, in less than a year um, of having these kinds of uh, initiatives and goals. So I'll mention a few now. Uh, one one of it is that one of the expressed goals of Governor Youngkin's Executive Order 19 is the requirement to post all regulations and supporting analyses 
in a centralized database or website. Um, and I've been told by Reeve that this, this website will provide easy access to all cost benefit analyses that the agencies increasingly produce them going forward. Uh, so despite requiring cost benefit analysis since 1981, the federal government does not have a centralized database of cost benefit analyses. Instead, you have to go to individual dockets for regulations and then search for them. And there's no easy filter for the cost benefit analysis and the names of the analysis uh, are not consistent. So number two, Virginia also has plans for consistent presentation of the results of these analysis in an economic review form. Uh, at least that's the name given to, to the analysis, I should say. And I was looking at one of these earlier today, and it was very easy to understand, sort of almost a table format, concisely summarized impacts. Uh, this seems simple, but presentation is important, at least if you want to reap the benefits of the regulatory transparency aspect that these analyses can bring. They have to be easy to understand. Uh, for if they're supposed to be useful uh, for to bring out important comments or to have folks understand how this is affecting their lives. In this way, uh, Virginia's form sort of reminded me of UK impact analyses that have a concise cover letter summarizing impacts. The third thing I noticed already, um, and I hope we can talk more about this, uh, and we've started to talk about this, is Virginia's plan for improving analyses and regulations going forward through retrospective analysis and review. And this is another area where the federal government has not found much success, despite a lot of talking about it across administrations. And then finally, Virginia also requires uh, consideration of impacts to three groups, small businesses, local government, and families, including low-income families. And this is right on that form. Uh, the federal analysis has done very little distribution analysis, especially analysis of cost burdens to low-income groups. So Virginia's experience here, too, might be helpful uh, to the federal government. So according to a 2002 Mercatus report by James Brugal and co-authors, there are many states that have CBA requirements, and there are many states that have some executive review. Um, and as far as I know, the federal government has not found much to learn from these other experiences. Virginia seems different because the form and the organization of its review process, it, to me, seems more similar to the federal government than when I've looked at some of these other states. Uh, Virginia also has more ambitious goals and has a lot of momentum. Uh, the manual for conducting regulatory review just came out, for example. So the hope is that... Um, it could provide benefits that can go beyond Virginia's borders too. So a lot of promises. Um, here are a few concerns I have, and maybe they're not concerns, maybe they're more questions uh, that I hope we'll get to talk, uh, discuss today uh, in this format. So the first one is, I guess, my broadest concern. Cost-benefit analysis has often been associated with deregulatory goals, uh, which sometimes limits its appeal from being broader. Done correctly, I don't see the analysis as inherently deregulatory. It's rather a tool for moving in the most net beneficial way from the status quo, whichever direction that might be. These Virginia initiatives, though, were adopted in an executive order that also requires explicit regulatory requirement reductions. For Virginia's reforms to be truly successful, they need to be able to withstand changing administrations with different priorities. And I'd love to hear how uh, you both have thought about this. The second is more on the 25% uh, reduction in the regulatory requirements. So when President Trump, uh, Reeve, you mentioned President Trump's executive order 13771, when President Trump directed agencies to adhere to a regulatory budget and eliminate two regulations for every new proposed regulation, I was pretty skeptical um, of the wisdom of the initiative. And I'd, I'd written about this to my co-author, Michael Livermore, about how the initiatives did not seem likely to improve net benefits of regulations or even really decrease regulatory burdens, among other things. Um, so thinking about these two goals, you know, you can imagine getting rid of a net beneficial regulation to me doesn't improve anyone's welfare and also reducing extensive, but, but maybe rarely used regulatory requirements might not do that much at all either. So in what ways um, is that regulatory requirement uh, 
reduction re requirement, I guess, uh, structured uh, so that it prioritizes the significant and costly burdens uh, and then becomes meaningful in a, and beneficial in a way that could get bipartisan support. Now, the third one is, uh, is a little different, and I was going to phrase it differently. It's about the quality of the analysis and some other aspects. Um, but given uh, uh, some things Reeve mentioned in his opening remarks, and even just looking at one of these analyses, I'm going to phrase it slightly differently, possibly possibly more controversially, but um, economists. <laughs> so I think of a part of the benefits of the federal cost-benefit analysis requirements was getting more economists into agencies to help think through the trade-offs and participate in designing regulations, brainstorming alternatives. So this seems to not be part of the goal at all here. Uh, and in fact, maybe uh, it, it's almost created in a way to not require uh, having more economists come into agencies. And I see the benefits of that, the streamlined approach you have taken and how readable and presentable it was. But is there some kind of a trade-off here with the quality of analyses, which I think is plays a large role in getting benefits from this? Uh, or maybe said differently, do you think CBA will have as much beneficial effect without that aspect of it? And then the last one, this is a little nitpicky. Uh, I'll just note this here but um the uh, so your office has created this terrific regulatory economic analysis manual it's concise it's readable you all can read it uh this is to the audience you all can read it uh after this webinar and it touches a lot of the important uh, points of undertaking analysis but there were two things that stood out to me uh perhaps because my experience is in federal analysis and i'm familiar with some of the controversies on the federal level so the first is I cannot help but notice that the analysis is required to be limited to the Commonwealth of Virginia. So it says, do not consider broader benefits and later costs created in the United States or the world. And I guess I understand uh, in some sense, Virginia should probably not be adopting regulations that seek to mostly benefit, say, New York, California. <laughs> But there is some value, I think, in calculating, uh, say, costs that another state might bear in a decision Virginia might make, or benefits for that matter, highlighting potential for some mutually beneficial agreements among states. And I'm wondering if this was considered. You know, I sometimes ask my students where they would place a smoke smokestack if they, you know, had were in charge of that decision for a state. And they always want to put it on the border of their state where the wind is blowing <laughs> the pollutants <laughs> off to another state. Um, and then the second one from the uh, manual. So after briefly discussing the value of statistical life, which is used extensively in the federal government to value the benefits of reducing fatality risks, the manual states you will likely rarely encounter regulations that require you to calculate the benefit of preventing premature death. And this su surprised me. Uh, at the federal level, such fatality risk reduction benefits make up the vast majority of benefits of regulatory action. And I'm wondering, is this a state federal difference? And what are most regulations doing if they're not helping to manage risks that people otherwise face? And then I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Well, those are such great comments and they they bring up so many questions that I would love to have answered. So maybe we can start with something I hadn't thought about, but that you brought up, which is the, the role of economists and how, you know, differing opinions on its rel their relative importance to this process and, and the goals of Virginia in particular of maybe reducing the role of economists and some difference of opinion on, on whether the merits of that proposal. So uh, Reeve and Andrew, I offer you some time to respond to that and explain what the thinking is there. Sure, we're, we're first, we had to take a look at what we had as far as Virginia resources were concerned. And there are very few agencies that have any economists on staff. And we thought it would be um, very burdensome to require all of our agencies to start hiring economists. We do have a group of economists in our Office of Planning and Budget, and they do some, some analysis of some of the regulations, particularly some of the larger regulations. But what we wanted to have was a um, cost impact um, 
process that did not require an economist. And if you look across the country, very few states have a lot of economists on staff. So, you know, this is, we also were part of an eye towards, you know, what would be useful other places around the country, other states. Um, so we, we purposefully um, drafted the manual and, and Ree was the, the primary author of the manual for the non-economist, but it also helps the general public. Um, yes, it's useful in having run a, a, the largest regulatory agency in the federal government, um, it is useful to have economists on staff. And I had a whole office of economists at EPA. But as, as the professor mentioned, it's, it's hard for people to find those documents. And it's also hard for the non-economists to understand the documents. You're looking at a couple hundred pages of cost impact analysis at the federal level for a regulation. Um, we wanted to have a manual that could be understood by the agency staff working on the regulations, but also by the, by the average Virginia citizen. So the average Virginia citizen can then go and look at the cost impact form, which is typically eight to 10 pages. It's easy to understand. If they have questions, they can go to the manual, which is only 20 pages long. And they can look at the manual and help them understand what the form says. And this is about transparency in the audience. You, you have to remember the audience here is your average Virginia resident. It's not, it, it's, it's not, um, it's not law professors and it's not economists. It's, it's geared towards um, the average Virginian so that um, they can understand what the impacts of the regulations would be on their daily lives. And I don't really have too much to add. I, I think that's that's precisely correct. That, that there's sort of a trade-off, you know. So I think, uh, you know, Carolyn, you're you're exactly right that you know there are definitely real benefits, you know, as Andrew points out, to having you know economists on staff at the federal level. You get these very sophisticated uh, analyses. Um, but the drawback, I, I think, is the very one Andrew mentions: a sort of lack of transparency and. The impenetrability, really, of, of some of these RIAs. That I mean, you know, I'm not an economist. You know, I actually have no economics background, but I've spent a decent amount of time working in the space. And to be honest, when I pick one of these up, I, I can't understand it. You know, it's it's like way over my head um, at the federal level. Um, whereas I think that the, the ones at the state level, you know, that we we've, we've sort of innovated. I, I think are actually pretty accessible. So. You know, we think there are definitely benefits. We're, of course, not opposed, you know, to agencies, you know, hiring economists and maybe eventually they, they will, though it's, you know, kind of a resource question um, as well. But I think there are some real benefits, you know, to the way that, that we've designed it. Um, and we sort of see the trade off, at least for Virginia, um, is, is working out well. So to paraphrase, if I may, economists did not pass a cost benefit test, at least on the state level. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you could say it that way. <laughs> I wanted to move on to the regulatory reduction goal of 25%. We, as both of you, have all three of you have referenced, the Trump administration had a similar program in place um, aimed at reducing the number of regulations on the books. I wanted to offer Caroline more time to expand on um, some of her perhaps critiques of the Trump administration's approach. Um, and I wanted to offer you both uh, time to talk about how Virginia's approach is different and improves upon that process and perhaps how we make sure that these changes are permanent. I'm very interested in making sure that, you know, if there are uh, beneficial changes that a new administration doesn't come in and backpedal and all of that. So I hand it over to you. Um, so I'll kick it off, but I don't, I'm not going to rehash some of the criticisms that I had of the uh, Trump, uh, Pre President Trump's executive order, because Virginia's uh, program seems pretty different and different in important ways. And, and we started to talk about this, um, but I was skeptical about um, all the assumptions that had to uh, be true or had to be made in order for the regulatory budget concept to really incentivize reduction of the net costly large regulations. And then even more so for the two for one which um, you know could have the perverse effect of stopping a re deregulatory action unless there's some kind of a requirement. It could delay getting rid of a really big one uh, until later if you need it to bank in some way. So there's there's a lot of things in the beginning, especially that made it 
uh, difficult to see how it would accomplish its goals. So the Virginia one is much more direct, 25% reduction of requirements. So I'm trying to think through um, some ways that, you know, this, this requirement could still um, be, it could be concerning in terms of meeting the benefits. So of course, not all requirements are completely pointless. So some are there, all are there, hopefully, <laughs> but let's be realistic. <laughs> At least some though are there because they do some net good. And hopefully going forward with the cost benefit requirement, that's a larger group of those. So I'm just wondering how that's thought about in this process of eliminating the requirements, whether they're net costly, et cetera. And similarly, if we're focused on the extensiveness of the requirements, you can imagine very extensive requirements that are almost rarely triggered, are there almost as in case of emergency, these are some, you know, and it'd be easy to get rid of those and say, look, we've reduced all these requirements, but they're rarely triggered. Don't feel it on a day-to-day -day basis and also might have some unintended consequences. So my mind was just going there to think about how this will be thought of. Um, I'll just mention briefly, again, this is exactly not on this, but um, OECD how, has recently released a report, um, which if I can find it, I'll, I'll link it, um, somewhere about the experience in other countries of these kinds of burden reduction uh, requirements, uh, whether it's regulatory budget or other types. And they talked about how, you know, for these to really be successful, there's so many preliminary questions that are sort of similar to what I'm raising that have to be thought about. Like, how are we counting what, what you know, goes to this um, and having all this established up front, et cetera. So I'm just curious to learn more about these, uh, about the practical implementation of this requirement and the and the kinds of goals that the administration sees that it's hoping to achieve. Sure. Well, first of all, um, our 25% reduction was based on a pilot um, here in Virginia in 2018 by the previous administration. And it was passed by our General Assembly. All 40 state senators voted in favor of it. Um, I think 98 out of 100 of the delegates voted for it. And this was to require all the agencies to count the number of requirements that they had on the books. And that it had two agencies, um, our, our, labor, our labor agency and- um, Department of Criminal Justice yes. Services. They both were tasked with trying to reduce their requirements by 25%. So it was just a pilot with two agencies. Those two agencies, um, one reduced theirs by 29 and the other one by 21%. So I think there's, there's a very important distinction between the two for one and the Trump administration, and I and I implemented that at EPA, and um, and I, I would say that we did the best job of all the agencies in implementing that. Um, that you know they have the two for one, but in, in ours it's not an it's not an either or. It's it's there's not um, you don't you don't have to look at it and say okay we can only do this or we can only do that. Um, it's it's a goal of twenty five percent, and as evidenced by the two pilots, um, one far exceeded and one didn't quite meet it. And while I certainly want all of our agencies to meet the 25% goal, I won't be at all surprised if some agencies have an easier time and others have a harder time. Um, and it's, you know, and it, was, it, was, it was funny when we first rolled this out, um, one, of the, one of the state senators from the, from the other party criticized this in the press saying, this 25% is arbitrary. Um, where did it come from? And luckily in the same article, the, the, um, and I didn't know he had said that, but in the same article, the reporter quoted me as saying, this came from a bipartisan bill that all 40 members of the Senate, including him, um, voted for. <laughs> so you know, there is bipartisan support for this concept in Virginia. So I hope that it will continue. And we saw legislation this past General Assembly um, trying to codify this. And I expect to see more legislation over the next two years trying to codify this approach. And then um, one other example that I just threw out there also from the cosmetology board um, is um, we, we had a re requirement in, in regulation that if you opened a new beauty shop, barber shop, spa, you had to have a restroom within your premises for the customers. And what we found and what the, what the, the board found was that a lot of new businesses are opening in shopping malls and there are public restrooms just down the hall from from the from the um, 
from the operation. So by getting rid of that requirement, if there is another public restroom available within so many yards, it saves those small businesses between ten and fifteen thousand dollars on building a separate restroom. Also, is that they're able to have a smaller footprint and they're able to use more of their footprint for more customer services. So that was a huge cost savings for small businesses, and that's what we want to try to encourage. And that's I think the main thing that I, that we've talked whenever we sit down with agencies, we sit down with a number of our agencies one on one to talk to them about how to reduce requirements. We want them to be creative and think about what are the unnecessary burdens that may be on Virginians. You know, and a lot of times these guidance documents, they're piled one on top of the other. Old guidance documents aren't revoked or rescinded. And so it's it's clear, it's cleaning out the regulatory closet to try to get rid of some of the things that are no longer pertinent. Um, but we we specify that we um, that you're, you're there not to get rid of requirements. Um, for, for public safety or health or, or the environment, um, that if those protections are important and we need to, we need to ensure that they remain. Yeah, I agree 100%. And, and I think one thing that I'm really heartened by, you know, as we proceed with this, because it's relatively recent that, that we've rolled this out, is we've sat down with a number of different agencies, and they're really excited about this. You know, they're really interested to look for innovative ways. Uh, and, you know, like the example Andrew gave of the bathrooms or another example is uh, there was a requirement that a form had to be notarized uh, when uh, somebody was um, filing information connection with child care services. Um, and that's, you know, that's completely out of date. It's very, very difficult anymore to find a notary public. And in this case, they were actually low income families that, you know, were being directly affected by this. Um, so, uh, the agencies are actually, I think, really, really interested. And, you know, from our experience so far, we, we found that there are a lot of things like this in the regulations that were perhaps well-intended uh, when initially adopted, but just really aren't necessary anymore. Um, and the exercise is designed to really try to identify um, what, what those requirements are and to really streamline things in ways that still are, of course, protective of, you know, public health and safety. Um, but that, you know, identify some of these things that are really just a burden and are, are creating, you know, a burden on the public and then ultimately wasting the agency's time as well to the extent that they have to spend their time, you know, looking at paperwork or, or doing things that are less productive than the other aspects of their job. One other thing I'll just briefly mention is, um, you know, Carolyn, you had asked sort of how do we ensure that we're not eliminating net beneficial regulations and um, I think a real virtue of sort of how we've designed the process is since everything goes through the cost benefit analysis, unlike at the federal level, um, any regulation or any action the agency proposes, including deregulatory actions, um, go through that benefit cost analysis. So, you know, we get a sense in any given case, is this actually net beneficial? Um, so I think that's a real virtue of combining the regulatory streamlining with the economic analysis. This might be my hard hitting Tim Russert moment, but I'm wondering if you have had any unexpected difficulties in implementing this program or have suggestions for what states might do differently. And I think related to that was a really great audience question about suggestions for other states where either the executive is less motivated to act. And so how do we get the, the legislature on board or even in states that are overall less motivated in the legislature as well? How do we, how do we uh, bring them along? Well, again, this um, the 25% reduction target started as a pilot by our legislature. So legislatures can certainly take a lead role, lead role in this, um, depending on the state, of course. Um, I can't say that we've had, I mean, we, we've certainly had a number of questions that have come up and how you count requirements. Um, and it's, um, you know, and I would say that Reeve and I both have learned quite a bit in talking to our agencies and trying to walk through um, the different regulations where we, we literally sat down um, with, with a couple of agencies and just looked at the regulations and helped them count how many requirements are in the document. Um, so, you know, there's certainly some things that we have learned and it's, it's not um, clear cut. Um, you have to be, you have to have room for um, 
for discussion. Um, I, you know, I, I don't really want to emphasize the word debate too much here, but certainly discussion and education between the um, area experts, the agency experts on the on the topics, and our office um, to make sure that we agree on what is a requirement and what would count as a reduction. And I, I will say that um, in reviewing the regulations and the guidance documents through our office we have ended up giving more credit to agencies for reductions than they have claimed. Um, a lot of them don't think that something is a reduction. And we've had to explain, no, you're reducing a burden. That is, we will give you credit for a reduction. So, I mean, that, I guess, was a surprise. I thought it might have ended up going the other way. I thought um, the agencies may have been trying to claim too many reductions. But if anything, I, I think the agencies are claiming fewer reductions than what we see. And we are trying to encourage them to be as creative as possible in um, coming up with how you reduce a regulatory burden on citizens. I absolutely agree. And I think in some ways, Anastasia, you sort of your two questions, I, I see as being kind of connected in the sense that um, one of the, the things I've been struck by is sort of what Andrew has just mentioned. You know, we put out this regulatory uh, reduction guide that I think is very, very helpful. But what we're seeing is that you know, a short 15 page guide really can't um, anticipate, you know, every single uh, permutation that, you know, agencies are going to encounter. So we're getting a lot of these questions. They're very good questions. You know, the agencies are thinking about this very, very closely and we've been able to work with them um, and come up with a good approach. Um, and I think in that sense, as other states are considering this, and I guess we'll sort of Put in, I'll put in a plug for sort of our office or something like our office. I think it's critical to have some sort of centralized leadership, you yeah. know, on this front. I think that in a lot of the states that have done budgets have not actually, you know, had a centralized office. And I think that's been a real challenge. Um, I think agencies want to do a good job, but they need to sort of have, um, you know, an integrated system are actually design, deciding how they're going to address these issues. Um, so I think as other states consider it, you know, whether it's the legislature or the governor's office, they really do need to consider, you know, whether they want to create something similar to our office. I, 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 would, um, I would say though that you don't have to create a large bureaucracy or a large office to deal with this issue. We're a four person shop and we're doing both the, on the regulatory side as well as the permitting. And we actually have other duties as well that we haven't gotten into today. So it doesn't take a large staff to do this. And I do this, I believe, effectively and, and appropriately. Um, so I, I wouldn't get, if I were another state listening to this, I wouldn't get discouraged about that. And we'd be more than happy to, to talk to any other state that is, that is considering something like this. It doesn't take a lot of staff, but it does take a couple, of, at least a couple of dedicated people so that there is somebody responsible for these reviews and who take the responsibility on. Well, there were so many great questions in the question and answer feature, and I wish we could get to them all. And of course, I could talk about uh, making uh, life easier by uh, deregulating for another hour or so, but I do want to get everyone out on time. So with that, I want to thank our panelists, thank everyone for joining. Um, I hope we can talk about this more in the future. And thanks to Federalist Society, and I will throw it back to Sarah. Thanks, Anastasia. I just want to thank all of our speakers for sharing your time and expertise with us today and to our audience. Thank you for tuning in. You can find more of our content on our website at regproject.org or follow us on any major social media platform at FedSocRTP to stay up to date. Until next time, we are adjourned.